Anjali Tripathi, Head of the Department of English. I also welcome Dr. Sambit Panikrahi, Associate Professor, School of English. All the invited guests, retired teachers, members of the civil society, my dear colleagues from all walks of life, and the friends from the media. And above all, all our students and research scholars of the Jain University who are watching this program. Now, this is the 10th lecture. We have already completed with 9 lectures. We, we, we had 9 lectures in the physical mode, but because of this COVID situation, we are forced to conduct, in, conduct this in a virtual mode. And we are thankful to uh, Madam Dr. Rita Morotra uh, for agreeing uh, to uh, and, con and consenting and uh, accepting the invitation on the Vice Chancellor side. So, Madam Namaskar and welcome uh, yeah. to this program. Uh, now, before we, before we move with the proceeding of this program, I request all of you to please stand up for our university anthem. I request our system manager, uh, Sri Asis Patel, to play the university anthem and we move forward. Please. <laughs> is working as the associate professor in the School of English of GM University. I request uh, Dr. Panigrahi to please give the welcome address. Dr. Panigrahi, sir. Good morning, everybody. I hope I'm audible to all. Yeah. Please carry on. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. At the very outset, I feel extremely privileged we have been given the opportunity to welcome all the esteemed dignitaries to this auspicious occasion of the 10th lecture in Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series, GM University. It's my pleasure to welcome into our midst Professor Dr. Rita Malhotra, Madam, retired professor of mathematics, Komla Nehru College, Delhi University. We owe a special and deep sense of gratitude to Professor Dr. Malhotra, Madam, an eminent mathematician, an English poet of our contemporary times, for having kindly agreed to grace the occasion as the esteemed invited speaker. With all humility, I welcome you, Madam, to GM University. I welcome our esteemed Vice Chancellor, Sir, 
Professor Atanu Kumar Pati, the main driving force behind this webinar. It goes without saying that under Professor Pati's able leadership, this relatively newer university has reached its heydays of intellectual and academic excellence within a very short span of time. Since our days of joining the institute, we have been witnesses to our esteemed Vice Chancellor Sir's relentless endeavor towards making this university an institute of higher academic excellence, both in terms of teaching and research activities. I extend my hearty welcome to Professor Atanu Kumar Poti, Honorable Vice Chancellor, GM University. I welcome to this forum, our esteemed registrar, sir, Mr. Girish Chandra Singh, who has always remained a pillar of strength and support to all of us, so far as administration and other intellectual and academic activities of the university are concerned. I welcome you, sir, to this auspicious forum. I welcome into our midst our deputy registrar, Dr. Uma Charana Poti, a very dynamic and efficient administrator and teacher as well, who has been instrumental for the smooth and effective functioning of this university all the time. He is particularly dear to us all for his extremely friendly, helpful and supportive nature and temperament. I welcome you, sir, into our midst. I welcome into the forum esteemed head School of English, Dr. Anjali Tripathi, whose contribution towards academic growth of the School of English is really commendable. She is the leader of a very dynamic and vibrant group of young faculty members of the School of English, who are deeply committed to contributing significantly towards teaching and research activities inside this reputed institute. Finally, a hearty welcome to all the participants, including faculty, students, Another dignitaries of GM University. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'll uh, request uh, Dr. Anjali Tripathi. Uh, she is heading the School of English of GM University. Uh, Madam Tripathi, please introduce our kid speaker to the audience. Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Am I Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning to all of you. It's a privilege for me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Nita Malhotra, the president of Poetry and Trust Culture, India a professor of mathematics and a retired principal of Kamla Nehru College, University of Delhi. A science talent scholar and awardee of the National Scholarship for Higher Education in Mathematics, Dr. Malhotra is a mathematician, essayist, poet, poetry critic, and translator, an exceptional and blessed combination. A PhD from the University of Delhi, Dr. Malhotra was awarded the prestigious postdoctoral French government fellowship at the University of Paris. She has sought as a visiting postgraduate faculty at the Department of Mathematics, University of Delhi, and visiting mathematics fellow at the Center of Advanced Studies, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Her research papers in mathematics have 240 plus citations and are published in India, Sweden, Belgium, Germany, Argentina, France, Serbia, Australia, and South Korea. She is currently a member and advisor of a number of prestigious associations, both in India and abroad. Dr. Malhotra has delivered numerous invited talks, keynote addresses, and chaired technical sessions 
at national and international academic conferences. Dr. Malhotra's poems and literary works have been published in about 20 countries and have been translated into Chinese, Romanian, Serbian, Spanish, Japanese, Turkish, French, Hungarian, and a number of other languages. She has received several national and international recognition for poetry, culture, and education. To name a few, the Distinguished Visionary Poet Award 2013, the World Poetry International Festival Award by World Poetry Canada in 2011. She has also received awards from Mongolia and Romania for essays in the domain of mathematics, literary prose writings, and poems have been broadcasted from time to time on the GOS services, the English Talk Program, and the national channel of AIR. She has been interviewed on television channels in Belgrade and China on her poetic books and on All India Radio. Uh, I'm sorry, madam, I'm leaving a lot of your achievements because if I go on reading, it will consume the whole session. Thank you so much for gracing the occasion. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, dear friends, uh, the JM University came into being on May 30th, 2015. So at the university, we are just five years old. But the institution, the GM College, the earlier GM College, before that, Sambalpur College, it was established in 1944. So we are in the 76th year. Our Vice Chancellor, Professor Atul Kumar Pati, he started the celebration of Platinum Jubilee right from 2018 when the university was the institution was entering to the 74th year. So last two years we have been celebrating the Platinum Jubilee in a very academic way. Other, other, other factors are there, other events are there, but academically we are trying to remember this event. And uh, during his tenure, in the last three years, we have conducted more than 20 national work, uh, uh, workshops more than 10 seminars, national and international seminars. And this is the 10th lecture in the series of Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. So now, all these programs, all the academic initiatives which are being conducted in Jain University, the driver behind all these things, the brain behind the, all these things is our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Atul Kumar Gandhi. Now I request our Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor to address the audience. Sir. First of all, I welcome Professor Rita Malhotra by saying, Bonjour, Madam. Uh, uh, because I remember, Bonjour. So I remember that uh, we stayed together in Paris in 1985 and 86. And uh, uh, another more important thing is that she was, uh, I was uh, her neighbor, immediate neighbor. And uh, there, there was a house called Major Dalan, meaning uh, House of India. Uh, so in that House of India, both of us were living in the sixth floor. And uh, her room number was 609, and my room number was 610. 609 and 610. OK. So I remember. That uh, although she is a very famous mathematics professor and working in very specialized area, but she has a special, you know, skill for uh, you know poetry. And then there is another additional thing which I must tell to the audience that she is also a very good singer. And uh, I have seen myself in different cultural evenings in Paris where uh, Dr. Rita Malhotra has sang very beautiful songs. So she is a multi-talented person. And uh, I hope that uh, you people will enjoy uh, this fusion of uh, uh, English uh, poetry with mathematics. And uh, I once again, on behalf of the Gangadhar Nair University, I welcome her. Uh, to this platform and the little you know that our university is only five years old but we are celebrating platinum jubilee this is a little which has been explained by uh, dr pati uh, and you know that uh, it uh, and the, the main institution was sambalpur college which was established in 1944 and then 
it was renamed as uh, Gangadhar Meher College. And later on, it became Gangadhar Meher Autonomous College and became a, a NAC accredited uh, A grade college. And uh, with a lot of stars and all that, and it uh, make it eligible for the um, to become a university. And the state government, on the, looking at the, all the achievements of this great college, uh, it was upgraded to university in 2050. So therefore, this is actually fifth year. But if you uh, refer to the Sambalpur College, then it, we have uh, just completed. 75th year of its existence. With these words, I welcome all of you again, and I welcome Professor Rita Malhotra. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Also, as as sir said, uh, we are fortunate enough to have got uh, Madam Dr. Rita Malhotra ji, our missed uh, CG reputed mathematician, a poet par excellence. As sir said, she is also a good singer. An academic administrator, former academic administrator, and again, today we will be talking about women's empowerment. So we are going to get a lot of things. So we, I believe, in our students, our teachers, and all the invited guests who have joined our program, they will get enriched by the lecture that we are going to have uh, from uh, Dr. Bolotra. So, Madam Namaskar, please uh, start your talk now. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. And uh, such lovely words for me. Thank you. I never thought Professor Pati, Honorable Vice Chancellor, would really go back to those days. And it is amazing that we have, you know, we are again together after, you know, more than 30 years, because uh, for so many years, we were not even in touch. And one of our co-mates there discovered us and, you know, finally put me in touch with, uh, you know, uh, put us in touch with each other. And uh, so, first of all, I have to begin with my hearty uh, felicitations, you know, for this kind of a milestone achieved. And I have um, known Professor Pati then, but that was, you know, just about one and a half, two years. Uh, but, uh, you know, what he has achieved since he took over as uh, Vice Chancellor, it is something that I think everybody is proud of. And I feel so privileged and honored to be here on this occasion, very auspicious uh, for the whole university, and to be among such an august gathering, the staff, the uh, you know distinguished members on the days, and of course, our distinguished guests, without whom we are nothing. So I think I'll just take a second to share my uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Kindly tell me if it's visible, I'll just do it. Uh, is it visible? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, I think without taking any more of your time and with a, a very hearty thank you to all of you, I will uh, straight away go to the subject for today, uh, which is poetry, a path to women's empowerment. And I think I would like to preface this uh, webinar or this address uh, by a little characterization of the self, S-E-L-F self, which usually is you know, defined as a projection of one's thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And uh, I feel that poetry is one of the, I can say it with conviction in fact, because when we say it's a projection of thoughts, feelings, emotions, it is usually reflected in one's decisions and pursuits. And with conviction, I think I can say that poetry is one such pursuit, it is one such medium through which one can you know, connect to as well as respond to the immediate surroundings, you know, our immediate surroundings. It is, of course, a form of communication also, but a very different kind of communication. Uh, a, communic a deep communication, I would say, with the inner being. And when we say it's a deep communication with our own selves, the inner selves, we are, in a way, on a path to self-discovery or, you know, discovering, you can say, the locus of our true selves or our true coordinates. That is the beauty of poetry. 
And I would say that even if one has never penned a poem, maybe one has never read a poem, but supposing one falls upon a piece of poetry, I feel that she, and here, excuse me today, because of the subject, I am going to use my subject as a feminine person, a woman. So I mean, I'm going to use she. So if she comes upon a poem, I would say that she will perhaps discover herself anew in the poem, which will act as a mirror for her. Why do I say this? So for that, I will, in this context, take you to my uh, first slide, I can say. Here, I'm taking up Romanian poet, Anna Blandiana. She's one of my favorites. And this is just a few lines from her poem called Suspicion. And you know what she says and why the poem appeal? It is in the interrogative and she's using the flower as a metaphor for the woman. So she says, does the flower have liberty when everything is fixed, the precise date when it blooms and dies, the smell it is supposed to emit and the color which sets it alight? So these are the questions. And I'll take another small tercet, a three-liner, uh, you know, which is kind of expressing similar sentiments. It says, the sense of pain intense in dry nights, dry dreams, the day ageless. So when I said that, you know, anybody maybe reading a poem for the first time can discover herself anew, you know, because we cannot undermine the power of language. And for all you know, if a woman has been through subjugation, through pain, through constraints, you know, these are the lines which will actually, you know, she will be able to connect to these lines. She will not feel alone again. She will be able to admire this expression because they're very captivating lines, very maturely written lines. That matters a lot. So when I say poetry, I mean lines which can actually stir the soul, which can actually reach out to you and the maturity has to be there. So as I say that if one has come across such lines and such sentiments, one will not feel isolated. And for all you know, she will take that first nano step to self-expression, <coughs> uh, sorry, and, you know, she will move towards freedom. So having said that, I would just like to say that poetry and poetics have a magical power, you know, because they intrinsically help us to uh, kind of identify all the rich analytical thoughts that are contained in them and thoughts which were as relevant in the past as they are now. Now today, as I said, I will be focusing basically uh, on the fact that how this intellectual form of art, this formal form of art, namely poetry, not only does it, you know, uh, change the course of one's life, but it also steers us towards success and empowerment. And when I say success, my measure of success is comparing my life of then with my life now and whether I feel a sense of completeness, whether I feel a sense of fulfillment today, that is success for me. And you will agree that everybody's, you know, definition of success or destination in life is not the same. That is why I take up the comparison between then and now. Also, you will agree that every woman's expression is very unique. That is because she has a unique consciousness of herself, you know, which includes her body, a body that is responsible for procreation, you know, and that is why her choice of words will be different from a man's choice of words because her journey is different. So when I say that she has a unique consciousness, not only does it include her body, it also includes her soul and it kind of nurtures her spirit. And usually you will see that she, you know, her writing would be not only original, but organic. It would be vibrant. And her expression, as I said, would be different uh, because of her experiences. And all this put together, or I can say this uniqueness, 
will actually put her on the path to self-discovery. And as you all know, Aristotle, the Greek uh, scientist and philosopher, he says, I quote, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. And from this wisdom, you know, that sense of empowerment is going to come uh, because uh, the next slide, if you could, uh, if you're able to see, I call it poetry is meditation because when we are talking of self-discovery, it is a kind of honest reflection. And I have always claimed and experienced that it is also a kind of meditation. Why? Because poetry expresses meaning beyond the verbatim interpretation of the written word. You know, it's not always the lexiconic meaning of the written word. You have to go beyond that. And it usually transports us to an elsewhere land. You know, that is how I express it. So let us see whether, you know, I think I can illustrate what I said with uh, uh, this, these three lines. It is a tercet. Uh, it says, she still searches for fragrance in the smell of dead flowers. Now, can dead flowers have any fragrance? Is somebody saying anything? Uh, yes, actually, uh, your PowerPoint is uh, in the on -peak. So that means you have seen your PowerPoint, but in a very reduced uh, so what I will request you is this better? To yeah, to pin the PowerPoint and unpin yourself. Is is this better? Uh, no, PowerPoint is still in a smaller frame. Uh, but in my uh, screen, it is showing a full full screen in the slide what mode. Do in your picture, you unpin yourself. Wrapping your picture. One second, I'll just try doing that. Yeah. One second, I'll stop sharing. Huh? And now I'll share again. I have uh, switched off my video. Mm -hmm. Just a second, please give me a second. Is it better now? Yes. No, it's good. So okay. you speak now. Don't pin, so, don't pin your, uh, your picture. Right. So I am continuing with uh, where I claim that poetry, uh, you know, when you are on the path to self-discovery, you need a lot of honest reflection. And poetry is a kind of meditation also. Why? Because I said that whatever words one uses in poetry, usually it goes beyond the verbatim meaning of the written word. And in this little tercet, if you see, we are saying, she still searches for fragrance in the smell of dead flowers. Now, how can dead flowers have fragrance? So if we actually go a little beyond these lines, we will see that when someone is searching fragrance in dead flowers, that means, you know, there is hope alive. It is all about hope. And so long as hope is alive and so long as hope is breathing, I think there is so much uh, you know, ahead of us, and we will move towards the right direction and perhaps step onto the path to success or to empowerment. Now, after this, I'll take you to the, you know, the very concept of empowerment. What do we mean by empowerment? Basically, we want to create an environment where the woman is not dependent. She can take independent decisions. And because in any nation, you know, women constitute almost 50% of the population. So this is very essential. 
Now, when I say she has to be independent, why why is it that uh, we are so so concerned about the women? Because women are natural nurturers. We all know, and sometimes her nurturing role and her creative engagements actually, you know, they are in conflict with each other because she needs time for that nurturing role. And uh, this sometimes, therefore, you know, uh, comes in between her creative. But talking of creativity, you know, very rightly, somebody has quoted that women are also natural healers. They are peacemakers. And I will just extend the list. They are also visionaries. And I'll extend the list by saying that, you know, with their creative hues, whatever aspect of light, life they touch upon or society or any aspect of society, they always, you know, value add to that aspect because of their creativity. Now, as soon as I talk of creativity, uh, if you can see, this is a Serbian poet, Razmila, uh, Radmila Lazic. And you know how I discovered her? Uh, a very creative person. Uh, this was a writer's conference in Belgrade. And, uh, you know, uh, I was invited to a coffee session with uh, a local lady, very creative. She was into writing plays and her plays used to be staged. And because she got to know that I'm from poetry, she gifted me with a book, which was an anthology of Serbian poetry in English, translated. That is where I discovered Radmila Lazic. And these lines, if you see, this is not the full poem. It, the poem is called The Poems I Write. It's a very unique name. So she says, I ought to tan my body on some rock far from the peers of disaster. I ought to emigrate from the land of apathy to the land of wishes. I ought to bathe myself in scented bubbles, draw a razor to my vein. These are the poems I write. So, you know, in the first few lines, you can make out that she wants to move away from the plural fetters, the plural chains, you know, of forced endearment in this real world. And she calls this real world so aptly as the land of apathy. That is the fourth line in her poem. And then what is so striking about these lines, if you see the last few lines, she, you know, the striking contrast between bathing yourself in scented bubbles and drawing a razor to the vein. Oh my God, this really hit me because here I feel that there is a lot of angst coming out angst and confusion at the kind of turbulence that we have all around. And uh, this story goes back to 2006. She had penned this poem much earlier. And today also in these unprecedented times that we are going through because of the pandemic, they are so relevant and her lines are so creative. So whenever we talk of creativity, Radmila Lazic comes to mind. And now coming back to the empowerment part. So we know that it is imperative for women, you know, to give voice to their, uh, or to give expression to their inner voice. Why? Because if she doesn't do it, she will disempower herself and she will be doing a disservice, not only to herself, but to her nation. Because, you know, ultimately giving power to women or empowering women, we are, uh, you know, contributing to the development of a nation, their peacekeeping efforts. So all this will be affected. Now, this is possible, but here I say to help her empower herself, poetry is one of the strongest contenders. Why do I say that? Because in poetry, each school of thought with their abundantly resourceful, poetic, aesthetic, and philosophical deliberations on various aspects, you know, diverse aspects of art, literature, culture, um, uh, they have actually nourished the discipline of poetry. They have enriched this dis uh, discipline. That is why I say poetry is one of the most powerful and transformative of the arts. It can really transform a person. And hence, I always go back that, you know, if a woman has to uh, uh, discover herself, poetry is really one of the ways out for her. I'm not saying it is the only way. Now, coming back to women's poetic consciousness, 
we have just now gone through Anna Blandiana's lines, Radmila Lazic's lines, some tercets also written by women. So what I would like to say is that she is actually changing perceptions of uh, herself, you know, through her writing, because poetry requires a very high level of reflection. And also, because of her refined sensibilities, her experience of anger, pain, protest, hurt, she is also able to change the perceptions of others about women. But of course, the pace is slow and, uh, you know, we have to work towards it in a big way. And now I think I can uh, take you to this little, uh, you know, quote by Swami Vivekananda where he says, it is not possible for a bird to fly on only one wing. For Swami Vivekananda, you know, uh, in his days, he knew that, you know, uh, for a nation, the, uh, the men and women form the two wings. So that is how he refers that a bird cannot fly on one wing. Now, coming to the past, we all know that in the past, women, their intelligence, their judgment, you know, they were always regarded with contempt. And the woman was almost always treated as an instrument of lust and actually turned hollow inside out. She was, you know, just supposed to compliment the men in her lives and she was never treated as an individual or a separate spiritual entity. But you know what is so interesting? It is interesting to know that in ancient India, you know, some independent women and some courtesans, professional courtesans like the beautiful Ambapali, you know, they actually cultivated their minds beyond a point, beyond what was permitted to them. And what they could do is they could self-express. Ambapali, why I take her as an example, because she was one person who could express herself and later on she actually left everything and joined the Buddhist order and found her freedom and her peace, you know. And this she could have done only because she could express herself. In these lines, again, this is not the complete thing, but these lines, she is actually, uh, you know, bringing out an eternal truth. And what is that truth? The truth is the inevitability of aging, especially aging in a woman. The truth is of the loss of fragrance of youth. Again, she's referring to a woman. And let us see what she says. She says, such was this physical heap, now decrepit, the home of pains, many pains, a house with its plaster all fallen off. The truth of the speaker's word does not change. The one line where she says a house with its plaster all fallen off. It's a beautiful line. She's referring to the woman as she is aging, you know. And I think these lines are a challenge to male domination with all apologies to our, you know, very nice uh, men here and the very um, kind of concerned men here present. But this is what she's referring to. She's challenging their domination over the years. And I think there is also a desire in these lines, which actually wants, I mean, she's trying to say that it's, you know, she's expressing her desire to move away from her existence, which was rooted in the past. So, you know, I think the, you know, her self-expression kind of internalized her power and she was able to find peace and freedom later in life. Now, this is a reference to the past, but what is happening? Even the 20th century women have faced a lot of subjugation, a lot of marginal marginalization, and some of them, it is very sad, but some of them have been shamed and they have been trivialized for their portrayal of female experience. So as I say that the assault on women continues and 20th century women have faced that. And when I speak of 20th century women, another favorite of mine, this is from the Portuguese repertoire, Flor, Flor Bela Spanka. She comes to mind. You know, she had a very traumatic childhood. You can see from her birth year and her death year, she died very young. She died at the age of 36. Her traumatic childhood because she and her brother were both illegitimate children and they were passed from relatives to relatives. Leave that aside. 
when she grows up, she went through two or three failed marriages. But the worst part of it all uh, was that she so beautifully expressed herself. She spoke about feminine sensuality, feminine sexuality, feminine desire, because she said, these are my honest feelings. And it was, you know, her writings, they used a lot of imagery from religion, uh, uh, imagery from nature, from symbolism. But the saddest part is, despite her creativity, you know, there was so much condemnation in society those days. And none of the universities in Portugal, uh, you know, they uh, included or even talked about any of her work, you know, in their um, whatever the literature courses or the literature discourses. It was not done. And she ended her life. Uh, some say she fell ill, but even one month before her illness, uh, she had attempted, uh, you know, suicide twice. But most of them say that she ended her life at a very young age of 36. Now here, the encouragement comes to us because she was able to express and she used that freedom of hers. She experienced that freedom of hers. But sometimes external forces are, you know, uh, uh, much more stronger. And sometimes we are not able to survive. I will read a few lines from uh, this poem of Flor Belaj Panka, which says to love. I want to love, love with abandon, to love for love's sake, here, there, and then she goes down. There is one spring in each life. You must sing it like spring, floridly. And if one day I must be dust, ashes, and nothing, let my night be a dawn. Let me know how to lose myself, how to find myself. Such beautiful lines. Anybody would fall in love with her. And that's why, you know, I, I brought her in as a 20th century woman. But in fact, you'll see a major volume of, you know, women's poetry. They take up their discourse in a tradition of oppression of women. Why? Because it has been an integral part of her through the centuries. And uh, but it is very important, you know, whatever a woman is, has been through, it is very important for her to express herself. You know, even if somebody tries to shut her down, because this expression gives her freedom, it gives her strength and peace. Why? Because you know, all those repressed feelings within her that, you know, they actually get an outlet. So it is a kind of catharsis for her. And at this stage now, I'm going to take you to the Nigerian poet, Ifi Amadiyum. And uh, she is one woman who has emerged empowered. And the way she writes uh, is, uh, you know, I I've taken these lines. We will soon know what she writes. And this was, I will not take you to the story, but this was another gift that I was given, a book on African women poets. And in these lines, which is called Bitter, just let us read the lines together. If you were to squeeze me and wash, squeeze me and wash, squeeze me and wash, and I foam again and again like bitter leaf left out too long to wither, you would not squeeze the bitterness out of me. These lines, you know, literally stay with me all the time that, uh, you know, I read about or I think about, you know, how women have been oppressed and, uh, you know, things are continuing even now in the 21st century. But I think through these lines, these lines are a kind of struggle against gender apartheid. And, you know, this repetition of the phrase, squeeze me and wash, squeeze me and wash three times. What is it telling us? It is actually, uh, you know, kind of expressing that deep seated bitterness, the magnitude of the deep seated bitterness within the woman over a prolonged period of time. But as I said, Ifi Amadium herself is an empowered woman. And, you know, today she is uh, actually recognized and regarded as a pioneer uh, contributing to women's discourses. And she also writes a lot about women's place in history and culture. Now, having taken up these poets, I think we should come back uh, to our very own Indian poet. But before that, because we just now read lines by Fia Madium, you know, Balzac, the French author, 
He had said, so rightly said, and I quote, poetry is born after painful journeys into the vast regions of thought. And I think that is what Ifi Amadium has given us, you know, beautiful poetry after those, uh, you know, painful journeys. It, you know, maybe she hasn't experienced it, but her sister, her mother, her, you know, friend, people around her. So these is, this is how the thoughts come to us. Now, coming to Kamala Das, late Kamala Das, she has influenced so many, you know, uh, poets of today, young poets, and I have no qualms in admitting that I am also one of them. Because before I had read Kamala Das, you know, I used to camouflage a lot of words, feelings, because that is how we were brought up. We were not supposed to, you know, we were told not to. Uh, speak out certain words. But when I read, read Kamala Das, that how beautifully, you know, she could combine art with, you know, her bold statements. She was a courageous woman. She, she also wrote a lot about feminine desire and sensuality. And, uh, you know, when I read a book, uh, it is a kind of an autobiographical uh, biographical book, which is uh, shown here, the cover is here. It's called uh, uh, My Story. Uh, and it was interspersed with a lot of poetry. That changed me totally. And, uh, you know, my writing changed. That's why I say she was an influence. Let us see what she says here. This is, again, just a part of one of her poems. She says, they let her slide from pegs of sanity into a bed soft with tears. And she lay there weeping. I shall build walls with tears, she said walls to shut me in. Her husband shut her in every morning, locked her in a room of books with a streak of sunshine lying near the door to keep her company. And I think it is, I mean, these lines we should not take as a surrender, you know, to the paradigm of everyday experience. But I think we should be encouraged, you know, to fight against all obstacles, you know, that we may come across. And Kamala Das is one person who, through her, of course, her quest for knowledge was immense. And through her, you know, this quest and her continuous, relentless self-expression through poetry, she actually, uh, you know, came close to the infinite or you can say close to the almighty and stepped on the road to fulfillment. And uh, therefore, I think she's an inspiration to so many of us. And now I take you to Orissa. We step into Orissa because I'm talking with uh, Upstate, which has almost become a second home to me, especially in the last seven, eight years. And uh, this story I have to share with you. This was the year 2019, last year, October. And in one of the sessions, and it is very humbling for me to say, and Professor uh, your Honorable Vice Chancellor knows, uh, both of us were actually, you know, being honored by the World Congress of Poets. And so we were made, you know, to sit with each other in the front row. And that is how I could communicate with her just for about five, 10 minutes. But uh, she, she lives a little away from Bhuvaneshwar. She's an award winning. In fact, she got the Saitya Academy Award for Uriya Poetry. And uh, you can see the number of collections she has. The two photographs of two of her covers, uh, they are not the perfect photographs, but this is what she could send to me because she has been in touch with me since then. And we talk every day. And uh, currently she's working on the biography of Odisha's famous Odissi dancer, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Padma Vibhushan, Sri Kelucharan Mahapatra. And I'm a fan, big fan, I used to be a big fan, never missed his programs whenever they were in Delhi. But why am I toy, uh, talking about Pravashini Mahakod? Let me tell you, through these conversations with her since October and now, I got to know that she has been through a very painful time and is still going through it. And, uh, she, uh, you know, it was a bad marriage, um, uh, a lot of uh, problems from the other side, the in-law side. And uh, she had to come back to Orissa after having spent year, some years in Delhi after her marriage. But uh, the saddest part is that 2015, when her husband died, the in-laws have dragged her to court with all kinds of, you know, um, allegations on her and they are not letting her claim a penny 
of what she, you know, actually should have inherited from her husband. And she is, you know, running from court to court and running, um, attending those cases. And she's not a working woman. And that is why I've started admiring her. And I have read some of her poems. A few of them have been translated into English. Uh, but uh, this is why. And when I speak to her, you know what she says? She says, Rita Ji, it is only my poetry that is, you know, giving me this inner strength that I am to, I am able to face so much all on my own. Uh, and perhaps, you know, I will someday, uh, you know, be able to see victory. Uh, and at least, you know, I'm fighting for my rights. So that is the beauty of uh, this uh, Uriya poet uh, from our very own Odisha. I should have written Odisha, perhaps I wrote Orissa, but please excuse me for that. And uh, then at the very outset, if you remember, I had mentioned uh, that poetry is a form of communication. And I think, uh, you know, you will agree with me when I say that every poet you know, uh, evokes a kind of unique tradition, a unique culture and practice through her poetry. And together with her reader, she uh, becomes knowledgeable about her distinctive heritage. And, you know, this knowledge, then it translates into an aesthetic appreciation. Uh, she gains a lot of, you know, spiritual strength. And the you know her perception of the world around her changes, and that is a big step to freedom, to success, to empowerment, whatever you call it. And uh, therefore, I would like to bring it Sonia Sanchez for two reasons. Sonia Sanchez belongs to the genre of African, uh, Ameri I mean, the category of African American uh, women poets because their poetry has been very powerful and uh, very rich, a lot of quality in their uh, poetry, and they have been able to actually change outlooks and attitudes and, you know, uh, some uh, change in thoughts they have seen. But the struggle has been immense. Sonia Sanchez herself had a traumatic childhood. She lost her mother at age one. She, uh, she was uh, put through relatives and shuttle, shuttle between relatives. She was with her grandmother. She lost her grandmother at age six. And will you believe that she started stuttering, stuttering when she lost her grandmother. And that woman today, this poet has emerged so empowered that she lectures all around the United States. You know, she has overcome all that and she has written throughout, she has expressed throughout, but her writing is not so, yes, she is fighting for women's empowerment all the time. She's written about women, but she's also, uh, you know, she writes about, she fights for equal rights and recognition and she writes about the discrimination against the blacks. Uh, so the difference between, you know, the white people and the black people. And in this poem, I've, this is not the full poem, but I'll just read the last four lines. She says, this country might have been a pioneer once, she's referring to America, and it still is, but check out the falling guns and shells on our black tomorrows. And this last line says it all, says all about her work and that is why you know my uh, admiration uh, of Sonia Sanchez and this poem is actually called right on white America you know and she says it's not the white guys who are bad it is all us black guys you know who are unarmed and you know we are the bad ones so that is a you know kind of a satirical statement um, but all their poetry, I will say, you know, uh, there is a lot of raw stirring in American, um, you know, this category of poets, the African American poets. And of course, there were plural movements, you all know, in the 60s uh, for women's liberation. Uh, what happened is because of those movements, uh, the poetry in America, as well as across continents, saw a marked change. And you know, earlier when the you know in the literary circles they always closed their doors to women poets. But after the 60s, you know, many of those doors actually were thrown open to women uh, because of the proliferation of women poets, and of course, I would say their quality writing. And as I express this, that this is poetry's gift 
gift to the now empowered uh, African American poets, the women poets. Uh, of course, things are um, still continuing. We know of the differences that exist. But I would now say that the whole gamut of a woman's experience of childhood, uh, adolescence, marriage, procreation, and life generally up to the time of death. And of course, the evolution of feminist consciousness, all this you know, we see in her writings. But many women have done it, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of adversity, so against adversities and obstructions, but sometimes violent obstructions have come in and they have actually lost their identity. But they, you know, uh, the encouraging thing is that several women have actually been able to transcend all the barriers and they have come through and emerged today, uh, you, you know, in success and as um, empowered women. As, uh, you know, uh, uh, whenever we are talking all the time, we are talking of self-expression through poetry, taking us to self-discovery. And that takes us to the, you know, uh, as Aristotle said, uh, you know, it gives us wisdom and then we uh, taste success or empowerment. So as Ralph Ellison, the American scholar, novelist, uh, he said, when I discover who I am, I will be free. And I always add to that, that when I am free, it is happiness that is going to embrace me. And that brings me to George Santayana, the Spanish, of course, he was born Spanish, but grew up in America. And he says, when happiness fails, existence remains a lamentable experience. And this is what we don't want for our women. So I want to, you know, go towards a positive note. And we can say that, you know, in today's changing world order, time has caught new horizons, defined new horizons. And women are slowly stepping out of their penumbral existence. They are expressing themselves. Yes, the pace is slow. And they are using this powerful tool of literature that is poetry with a very strong sense of purpose. What is that purpose? They are questioning their own identity. They are questioning the norms of society. And of course, they are exploring life. And what is admirable about these women, you know, who are using this intellectual art form, this formal art form uh, to express themselves is that they are still, many of them are still doing it against, you know, in defiance, I would say, of alienation from the kin of ostracization. So they are those brave women. And uh, she is slowly paving a path for herself towards empowerment, uh, you know, uh, you know, away and moving away from these uh, uh, prevailing prejudices, if I may say. And actually, you know, the woman today is what? She is an amalgam of uh, intelligence, sophistication, intensity, sen uh, sensitivity. And all these, you know, converge together um, and, you know, she's able to use them uh, to explore, you know, life at micro, uh, micro levels. And of course, one more beautiful thing comes from poetry that when we are expressing ourselves through poetry, uh, we are able to uproot ourselves and create that emotional distance which is required to capture the world around us. It is very important. I think William Wordsworth also said it, that, you know, what is poetry? After all, it is your feelings or emotions which you recall in tranquility. You know, so that distance, emotional distance has to be created before you can actually write um, uh, uh, touching lines or uh, poetry, you know, in its uh, real form, or there should be poetry in your lines. Some people uh, call everything poetry. It is happening today, but that's okay. You know, everybody has their own uh, way of uh, expressing. So I would only say that the new woman today, she has questioned herself. And where is she seeking her answers? She's seeking her answers everywhere. Uh, let me be a little poetic. In every leaf, in every pebble, in every shell, in every dewdrop, in her own fears, in her own enthusiasm, in her desires, in her willingness, unwillingness. So, you know, she is looking for answers everywhere. And this is how she is getting empowered. And uh, if I may say so, that woman today is no longer 
you know, the mirror that only and always magnifies the image of her man. She is creating a space away from the, you know, whirlpool of complexities and, um, uh, you know, uh, the vortex of, you can say, uh, complexities, the constraints, the stresses of society, and she's questioning the norms. Now, I would, I, I think, come to the conclusion part, but here I have to um, uh, give you a small story because it's very relevant to the topic today. And uh, because uh, Dr. Tripathi had asked me to read something of mine, but I have chosen a very old poem. This is called Bindi, as you can see. And uh, the picture is that of an Odyssey dancer, uh, again, a very graceful form of dance of, you know, your very own state, Odisha. Uh, the story goes this way. It was the year 2005 when, you know, um, we had an international poets meet at Taiwan. And the best part of it was one of the sessions was called Women's Secret Meeting. So in that session, only the women poets were allowed to, you know, uh, give their renditions. And there was a linguistics professor who actually had translated our poems into Mandarin. So she was chairing that session. After the session, uh, uh, there were four other ladies. We were total uh, seven from India, four ladies. And all of us were standing with the professor uh, waiting for the bus to take us back to our hotel. So she happens to see, and you know, today, whatever you see, my the size of my bindi, that time I used to wear a very huge bindi. It was four times this size, and I loved it. So she happened to ask me, all four women in saris and bindi, she said, Rita, why is it that you're wearing such a big bindi? So, and the others are so wearing the very smaller ones, you know, they're just spots. And she didn't say bindi, she said the spots on your head, you know. So I said uh, very spontaneously because it, because it was an unexpected question. So I said, oh, because I, do, I don't want to get lost in a crowd. I want to be noticed in a crowd. And she was the one who said, is it a sign of women's empowerment? And I said, yes. So this was all in the year Ma uh, 2005, March. And by April, I came home. I penned Bindi. So I'm going to read it out for you. As I said, it is also, it confirms to today's subject. So uh, it goes thus, Bindi, cast mark on the forehead, fetters of nuptial nexus, symbols of trapped desires trying to make sense of a fragmented self, or a mark of profound piety, an intricate spider web of connotations, unseen in the maze of stories on women, in myth and history. But other eyes, as do mine, see the bindi sparkling proud like rising sun on stone. Vermilion red smiles high in beautiful solitary splendor. It journeys through myriad moods as the tender sapling little girl grows into a luxuriant tree. God's blessing in beauty's guise, the bindi speaks. I empower, I endow her with a sense of space. As I pave the vibrant way, she remains the soul of this day. Thank you so much. And I think uh, I end with that. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, what an excellent lecture. Uh, you started with poetry and meditation. Uh, a few lines that I must uh, read here before we move to the question. Uh, she still searches for her pregnancy in the smell of dead flowers. Then you also, you also talked about when happiness fails, existence remains a lamentable experience. Great lines. And the conclusion was excellent, excellent. I have no words. Uh, you, you ended the lecture with Bindi. Uh, the Bindi speaks about I am power, I endow, and everything else that you. Uh, so, excellent lecture. Uh, at at uh, the student of economics, I tried to understand, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I have done justice to myself or not. Uh, but definitely, if you get you your uh, PowerPoint presentation, then we will definitely uh, discuss with our English professors and we will try to find out. Uh, other aspects of what you have to uh, tell the, our audience. Thank you so much. Now, uh, I request Dr. Arjun Tripathi to conduct the question and answer session with me. Madam. Thank you so 
Thank you very much, Madam, for the wonderful presentation on poetry of path to women's empowerment. Uh, I can't resist here reciting a few lines from Emily Education. They shot me off in prose. They shot me off in prose as when a little girl, they put me in the closet because they like me still silent. Indeed, <coughs> poetry adds wings to one's dream, gives voice to the unspoken in a woman's life, and exercises an empowering impact. Okay, now we will take up the audience's questions. In fact, I would like to ask the first questions, if, uh, question, if you allow. Uh, that can silent protest be called a mode of empowerment for a woman? It seems to me paradoxical. So please express um, your position on it. Uh, I think you are very right. I don't believe in silent protests. To a certain extent, we may be able to create some kind of an awareness. We don't want to go into violence. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is not either silence or violence. You know, so we have to, that is just one expression, but I will always say, express as much as you can. Our silence will not speak all the time. Sometimes silence speaks for itself, but not all the time. And not everybody might be able to hear the silence because they have to, you know, the others have to hear the silence. And most of the time I have seen that when we are, you know, working towards women's empowerment, whatever level, the government level, the nation level, at smaller levels, you know, we are not including the men. The men have a huge role to play in women's empowerment. So I would say that silence is not enough. It is a, you know, maybe a, the first step to uh, protest or to, uh, you know, make an awareness amongst others. But I think finally it comes to expression, whether you express in different ways, it doesn't have to be poetry. This is just one part. But why I, you know, always uh, kind of favor poetry because uh, of the, kind of level of reflection that you have to go into to pen poetry. I mean, everything is not poetry. When we say poetry, we are talking of, you know, the uh, not only the worst crafts and all, it is, it has to touch somewhere. It has to touch a chord. It has to stir the soul. So silence will not be enough. I think I will say that. But yes, we don't want violence also, uh, but somewhere in between. And there's a lot to do. Thank you, Madam. Um, my colleague, Dr. Mullidhar Sharma, Assistant Professor of English, has a very interesting query here. He says that, in his opinion, Ampatali is more of a victim of an uncompromising patriarchal setup, social setup, and not an emblem of emancipation. And he has his regions here also. Uh, if you can see the chart box, Mullidhar Sharma. Uh, is, it, is he talking about Ampatali? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, see, uh, one thing is going into history. First of all, you know, actually, when you think of Ambapali, um, I won't say she was a myth, but there is a lot of writing about her. Yes, there are interpretations about her. But you see, even in the examples that I gave, uh, whether it is Flor Belaish Panka, whether it is, you know, some people have also been victims to external forces. But the moment you're able to express, and because she could take to Buddhist order later in life, maybe it was much later in life, but I will at least say that she did not waste herself. And somewhere when you're expressing yourself, you are gaining that strength, that internalizing of power. But yes, academically, I understand you need, especially, you know, uh, I would, I admire the people. Uh, I mean, I take you all as my mentors, the people who are from the English department, who go deep into literature, who go deep into the study, the technicalities. I'm an outsider to literature. So my uh, emotion about poetry comes only from the heart and whatever I have read through poetry or through the art of writing poetry so that. So I will say that when she has been able to express, that is also a kind of challenge. And if she's expressing, imagine the time when she was expressing, when they were so oppressed, nothing was allowed to them, they couldn't speak. And even today, I want to take up one example here I think you all have, uh, you might be knowing it, especially people from English literature, about the Afghan poet Nadia Anjuman. 
she was battered by her husband she was not accepted by her family just because she penned poetry questioning you know the uh, and, uh, you know the suppression of women and she lost her life at the age of 25 so i would say she was a failure till she was alive whatever she could do and she used to actually read shakespeare you know they were banned in afghanistan but in a secret uh, you know building and uh, this thing they used to get together and read uh, authors like shakespeare so even though you know she lost her life she couldn't make it so i will i just take examples like this and i put ambapali in that category that you know somewhere she did try to express she did try to come on that path and somewhere i think she got peace later in life but uh, you know everybody is uh, uh, i would say has a freedom to their interpretation why not you know especially in a subject like literature uh, so that's all i can offer yeah thank you madam thank you uh, dr rumna mitra Uh, an educator and uh, scholar and a poet from delhi has uh, comments here in the chat box two very important and important indian women poets who come to my mind is stand here mahadevi varma and subhadra kumari chauhan and undoubtedly meera bai in spite of all the odds around them they first with their lyricism and poetry and of course kamla das or kamla sureya as you have pointed out uh, even dr maheshwara devi Yes. Who was most known for her short stories and novels? Uh, she wrote some of the powerful, profoundly empathetic, empathetic women-oriented poems. True. Then uh, we have another question from Janna Rani. Uh, Dr. Janna Rani is an assistant professor in the Department of English, and she has written. Thanks so much, ma'am. Can you please tell us what do you mean by emotional distance, and how to maintain emotional distance in confessional mode of poetry? that's considered to be the best suited to give voice to a woman's inner self yeah uh, i think uh, just before i'll answer this question uh, 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 i would uh, appreciate rumna's observations and um, uh, she specially mentioned mahashita devi mahashita devi was very close to me and i don't know whether um, your honorable vice chancellor professor pati knows but while we were in paris and we were staying in maison de land as he mentioned mahashita devi was invited by the french government Uh, because she was of course award winning and uh, she had to stay in uh, paris for a week and can you imagine she refused to stay in a hotel and she was staying in the room opposite mine just opposite mine you know diagonally opposite mine and in those seven days uh, we became uh, very good friends in the sense you know she was invited to a house boat in paris for dinner and when she was leaving her room and i happened to go to her room her coat was all crumpled Her, she did not ha- her hair was falling off she did not have a juda pin i'm bringing this up because uh, rumna amitra has actually taken me back to those days and i told her mahashita ji you will not go to a party in paris because those days the kind of impression they had about india and indians as a country of uh, elephants and all i said you're not going like this luckily i had bought a new coat and i had a lot of these juda pins and i dressed her up for that occasion so mahashita devi and when she came back to india she met my parents and in the you know uh, in that journal besh she had written an article and she had mentioned all this and she is in fact i think your english department would have read it something that has moved me in mahashita devi is her uh, the book called breast stories how a woman has been exploited through time you know it is called breast stories and three different stories how her breasts have been exploited and that i think stayed by only thing is marshita devi i did not mention because she was not into poetry it was mostly prose but yes she was one uh, person i admire and you know we have so many names from maya angelou to silvia plath i mean there are so many other names and indian names also tara patel is one but anyway now coming to your question you know wh- what i mean by the emotional distance you see when i am going through a very bad phase i am in pain i 
and I try to pen something. Maybe I'm actually writing something to, you know, give some kind of a, a outlet to my emotions, but that will never be good poetry. You will have to maybe rehash. So whenever you're trying to capture something, whether it is an emotion, I can only say as a first hand, you know, because I have first hand experience, we are writing and we have been writing that if I have to pen good poetry, it has to be when I have been through that emotion, I have been able to, you know, contain myself. I have been able, I'm now free of those, especially if the emotions are very painful, even happy emotions, you cannot capture them as beautifully, especially I'm talking of poetry, prose may be different, but uh, you cannot capture them unless you are now quiet in your mind the calmness has come and you know even in confessional poetries you know whatever poetry you write when we say poetry one thing is you know anything you call as verse or poem but especially people from the english department would understand that the element of poetry has to come in you know and poetry we always associate with some kind of you know beautiful it is beyond this world so i always feel that you have to be, have a very tranquil mind a peaceful mind and your emotions should be contained now before you are able to capture those emotions or whatever you are trying to pen. And even if you have penned something while you are going through those emotions, well, that can always be rehashed and made into good poetry. So I think that is all I would say. Thank you, madam. We are all Maya Angelou's phenomenal women, though it is the yes. low woman's land. Yes. Then, uh, one of our MP scholars, Ankita, Ankita Panda, has thanked you for enriching us with such an intellectually stimulating lecture. Her question is, what are the institutional and societal norms that we need to change in order to empower women from all sectors? Yes, I think the first norm, again, with all apologies to our men, but all men are not like that. We have to change, you know, we have to include men. We have to sensitize them to what a woman is really all about. Many of our men are also, you know, writing for women's empowerment uh, and they understand it so well. Maybe because if today I'm speaking in an independent and a very comfortable kind of ambience, it is because, you know, the men in our house has been able to. So first of all, we have to include our men. And from the very, very, uh, you know, we, uh, it's an appeal. I always appeal to the parents, our, uh, you know, uh, the parents all around. Please never discriminate between your son and daughter. The little boy has to be sensitized from childhood how to behave with the sister, how to respect, you know, the sister and the women in our family. Somewhere it is our families, you know, themselves. And please, anything that happens, even when a girl child is, uh, you know, molested, usually it happens, it begins in the family. Let us all protect our little children, sensitize our boys, and include our men, you know, our mature grown-up men, to help us in this, because that is the only time. Besides what has been, uh, you know, done uh, maybe by governments, there are so many women's associations, uh, they are helping the women to, um, you know, empower themselves in different ways, even at the very, uh, you know, uh, the, that strata of society, even our domestic workers. I know in my neighborhood itself, somebody, a philanthropist has opened up, you know, has given a lot of space, teaching them various, you know, skills from, uh, sewing to um, painting to handcrafting that is not enough so I will say include our little boys sensitize them from the very beginning and include our men in this the rest you know we all have a responsibility towards ourselves also and economic independence for women <laughs> that is very important thank you madam uh, my teacher, Professor Savita Tripathi from Sambalpur University, has thanked you for the wonderful grief on poetry. Thank then, uh, you, Professor Vishnupriya Hotta, uh, who has retired from uh, the Department of English of the GM University, has thanked you for the excellent deliberation on women's socio political empowerment through poetry. Uh, we have some more questions, but we will, I am afraid we will not be able to take them. But just I would like to mention that Professor Sivakutta Das from Department of Geography has uh, commented that it was an excellent lecture. 
uh, dr nivedita nath head of the department of anthropology she has a question and dr manosmita mahapar a chodi of uh, department of sociology she has her observations here uh, i would tell them to contact you individually if they uh, want to clarify their doubt but due to paucity of time we have to stop here taking questions so thank you very much madam for patiently answering the questions it was a thought provoking and enlightening uh, interaction a discussion thank you very much thank you so much and uh, dr tripathi you can give them my number no problem but yes. i have to i am always let me now make a confession i am always afraid of the english department because i am a total outsider to the you know and your knowledge of you know english and poetry and the technicalities of poetry we can never match up to you so whatever comes come from you know an honest heart that's all and um, i don't know whether i should say this but let me because it is uh, uh, open to everybody uh, you know it has been with me since my childhood and let me uh, make a confession today not that many people know it but when i got married i literally fought again i mean with my parents with my in-laws that i will not have a child unless i have adopted a girl child and my daughter today who herself has a daughter she is my you know adopted child uh, from those days and uh, initially there was a lot of you know you can uh, imagine uh, people were not able to accept it but uh, i think she is our oxygen or, 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 she is the oxygen of our life and my son was born only 7 years later so you know it has been within me this protest this anger and you know talking about the girl challenge 50% i think 40% of my poetry is all about the exploitation of the girl child the child woman and women so it is just a, it's not a confession many people know about it i have no qualms in speaking about it but thank you so much it's a lot of love that i received from you all and especially our honorable vice chancellor i am so proud to you know speak about him that you know we how we could connect after 30 years through another person i think i have to just thank god for this opportunity thank you so much I remember this uh, Mas Mahesh's visit to Netherlands, but at that time I was interested in football. You know, <laughs> I was playing football. At that time. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, before we go to the next segment of the by the registrar, uh, I must thank uh, the School of English uh, led by uh, Dr. Anjali Tripathi. then dr uh, sambit panikai uh murlidas sharma lili ma'am and nirjorani tripathi uh our pedra sir brahmananda pedra sir then jharana uh, so uh, we are thankful to all of you all the students of department of english all our faculty heads of departments everyone all the students who have joined this program uh, so a formal word of thanks now by our registrar sir girish singh sir thank you respected vice chancellor sir Respected chiefs for the day, Dr. Rita Malanta Madam, heads of the various department, all faculty members, non-teaching staffs, invited guests, students, research scholars, stakeholders, and media persons joining in this event. The GM is greatly indebted to Dr. Rita Malanta Madam for sparing his valuable time for the benefits of our students, teachers, invited guests. thank you madam for the excellent lecture we are honored the jeo family thankful to our honorable vice chancellor for the way he has been empowering all of us for the last 3 years we are fortunate to have you as our leader sir thank you sir we are thankful to the faculty students of the schools of english for taking interest in having this lecture organized special thanks to Dr. Anil Tripathi, madam, and Somit Panigal for uh, personal their responsibility in the best possible manner. Last but not the least, I note for Patricia for all invited guests, staff of the JMU, all students, media persons, and everyone present. Special thanks to our technical support team, thereby the Ashish Patel, Priyanka, Sushil, and others. Thank you. 
Thank you, everybody. Now, before we close, I request uh, our system manager, uh, Asis Patel, uh, to play the national anthem. Then, after that, our vice chancellor will declare officially the closure of the meeting. So, please stand up for the national anthem. जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा हिंद हिमाचल यमुना उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे पालक भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे Jaya, 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 jaya. Uh, now I request our vice chancellor to officially close the meeting. I declare this meeting closed. Thank you.